Hi everyone, it's Amy Kennedy here, ceramic artist and artist mentor. This is the latest in my series of long form conversations with people that I know are going to add a lot of value and insight to me and to the artists that I work with and artists in my wider community. So today's conversation is with Eliza Dawson, who is the executive director of Res Artists. Res Artists is the world's largest residency membership network. I'm sure many of you have heard about it and what it does, but we go deeper into this in this conversation. Eliza is a wealth of knowledge in this area, not just in her role of being the executive director of Res Artists, being on the board. She worked for six years at AsiaLink as arts residency manager. So she knows what she's talking about here. You're going to love this. She gives the top two mistakes she sees artists making all the time in their artist residency applications. So she's seen thousands and thousands of applications, people. She knows what she's talking about. But this is one little itty bitty part of our conversation. We talk about what artist residencies are. They are ever changing. We talk about what Res Artists is as an organization, what its values are what it offers artists and its members, what it offers residency organizations, how it vets its members, what it offers in terms of people who want to set up an artist residency themselves. And this is so important. They have a very comprehensive A to Z handbook on this. We talk about the impact of COVID on artist residencies and the field of artist residencies, which has been significant and the ongoing research and surveys that they're doing in this, in this area. I'll take a breath here. And we also talk about the emergency residencies that they are connecting artists and cultural workers from the Ukraine to. So this is quite a wide conversation. And we also talk about a fascinating project that Eliza did herself at the Fukutaki House Asia Art Platform in Japan, uh, which was a super interesting project. There is lots here. Please let me know what you think about the discussion in the comments please go and visit Res Artists on all the links that I have in the notes. A huge thank you to Eliza Dawson for your time. Let's begin the conversation. Everyone, my name is Amy Kennedy and I'm a ceramic artist from Melbourne, Australia. And I'm delighted to be having a conversation with Eliza Roberts today, who is the executive director of Res Artist. And Res Artist is the global residency network for artist residencies and it's the professional body that supports the field in many different ways and we'll talk about a bit about that today. So welcome Eliza, thank you for joining me today. Thank you Amy, thanks for having me and um, and just to correct you, it's Eliza Dawson. Oh sorry Eliza, <laughs> oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. Uh, no that's my old name, but it's quite old so <laughs> oh, it's still, it's still mine. It's still mine in different places. Oh my god! Uh, yeah, it probably pops up everywhere. My apologies, Eliza Dawson. Eliza Dawson, thank you so much. Yeah. Um, and Eliza, we we're just talking about before we started recording that um, I saw you from afar at the 2019 Kyoto uh, Res Artist Conference, the yearly conference there. And um, I was doing a residency at the time at Shigaraki Ceramic Cultural Park, and so I just sort of got on the train and hopped down there. The timing was just perfect. And um, it really opened my eyes, as I was saying before, to the whole sort of sphere of artist residencies. I was sort of on my narrow track of what I want in an artist residency. Can I realise my project? But there was so much more going on. And I think this is a great thing about res artists. But how, how did you find that conference? Uh, look, I thought it was a fantastic conference. I mean, I'm a bit biased, but um, it was a, a particularly good one and a particularly poignant one looking back um, because, as you know, Amy, having been there, we were talking about how external factors had shaped the field of arts residencies. So we were looking at things like, um, you know, Airbnb, um, AI, AI, um, humanitarian crises, you know, climate change, things like that, and how the field was responding to that um, and developing new arts residency models. Um, and of course, we were all sitting in the room that was, I think, early 2019. Yeah. Um, and no one could have predicted the um, forthcoming pandemic and the way that not only shaped the world, but also the arts residency field. Um, and then, you know, became another example of that, um, the, the way that it, those external factors continue to shape the, the landscape of international arts residencies moving forward. Um, mm -hmm. 
but yeah, I think all of our conferences offer something new, different perspectives. We sort of look at a particular angle of the field or focus on a particular region. Um, and we try and offer different settings each year, different locations around the globe. Um, and so I think, you know, people like yourself, artists or those who are new to the field, um, get a lot out of it, but also people who've been in the field for a very long time, myself included, um, you know, just to get together with that sort of global think tank of members and non-members and um, have a discussion, you know, address issues in the field and try and problem solve together and brainstorm for the future. Mm, yeah, it was wonderful. It was wonderful. I did get a little bit distracted by the city of Kyoto because it was so, <laughs> so I was sort of oh. missed a few of the presentations. Okay. Oh, it's so beautiful, isn't it? Yeah, with this, it was just, you know, amazing, very sort of romantic with the snow falling outside and all the delicious food. And um, we sort of obviously tried to incorporate aspects of that into the conference through excursions, but also we had, um, you know, a traditional tea ceremony and then a very non-traditional contemporary take, which was an art installation and performance um, of a tea ceremony. So, yeah, I think everyone... Um, went away feeling you know very engaged with Kyoto and broader Japan as well. Definitely, definitely. Um, and before you were um, the inaugural uh, executive director of Rosatis, um, you worked at AsiaLink for about six years or so and you were the arts residency manager there. So in that capacity you would have seen a lot of artist residency applications Mm, yes, many, 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 <laughs> thousands yeah. and thousands, yeah. Um, and what would you say, um, sort of really coming from um, questions that my artists would ask me in my programs, yeah. are the main mistakes that artists would make in, doing, in writing an application or submitting an application? Mm. Yeah, it's a really good question. And I know it's a, a regular question. Um, and I guess most people's response is sort of the usual, you know, haven't proofread it or things like that. But for me, um, over those six years, uh, I think I, I really honed in my skills because we were having to look at so many, like literally thousands of applications. Um, and it became very quickly apparent as to what those red flags were. Um, so I would really encourage artists to think about where they want to go and why and how that matches their practice and proposal. I think, you know, very often um, it comes across as the artist has just sort of seen somewhere that looks good or, or they've heard it's good and applied, but it's, it's the match between the two is not there. Um, mm -hmm. So that match between the artist practice proposal and the residency host organisation and country. That's really important. Um, but also I think artists sometimes feel like they have to be very concrete in their proposal. And, you know, I know that a lot of um, funding bodies, for example, the forms that you have to fill out are very conducive to that. Like you feel like you have to have a budget, a timeline, all this sort of stuff. But I would um, sort of almost say the opposite. You, you need to have a vague plan, yes. But I think it's really important that you um, somehow voice within the application that you are open to opportunity so mm -hmm. that um, the assessors know that you're sort of flexible and you're also willing to sort of give and take from whatever culture you're going to and visiting. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess as an example, if, if you went there with a very solid project in your head, you'd be more inclined to kind of sit in your studio and just work away on that as you could back in Melbourne or wherever your home studio is. But if you go over there and spend a bit of time sort of exploring and engaging with the environment, um, you know, communicating with the community members and networks that you develop over time, um, it means that you can seize opportunities. So you might go to an opening and meet someone um, and then suddenly that takes your residency on a whole different path and that's okay. Like that's what they're for. Yeah. Um, it's really, you know, the time when you can do that. It's kind of a very special time where you can be a bit more experimental. You can try new things um, and take risks, take different paths. 
So I'd really encourage artists to try and um, use some lang language throughout their application that expresses that they could be open to those opportunities. Yeah, great. Thanks, Eliza. And I totally shot ahead from my, my, my <laughs> list of questions here. I've gone out of order, people. So I wanted to backtrack a bit, Eliza. Thanks. And um, say, why artist residencies for you? So this big chunk of your life at AsiaLink, big chunk of your life currently at Res Artists. You know, you know you've also got background in, um, uh, you did your master's in curatorship and um, creative arts study too. You've worked in a lot of different areas of the arts sort of sectors, but you've chosen artist residency. So why why is that? Yes, yeah, a very good question. Um, as you sort of outlined, I, I think when I started out and particularly when I was finishing off my master's in art curatorship, I, I sort of knew I wanted to work in the arts, um, but I didn't know exactly where. And I really wanted to get a holistic vision and handle on it all. So I worked in a, a very broad range of places. So auction houses, you know, museums and institutions, commercial galleries, um, both locally and overseas. And um, I ended up sort of curating, I think it was, it was an exhibition of um, Malaysian art work and that sort of stemmed a bit of an interest with the international scene um, and then ended up working at AsiaLink on their arts residency program. And I think like you, um, I actually, AsiaLink was a member of Res Artis at the time. And um, this was before I was on the board. I attended my first Res Artis conference in Tokyo in 2012. And um, I th yeah, I, was, I think I was like you. My eyes were just sort of opened up to this amazing universe of arts residencies and everything they encompass. And for me, I just feel like I can never get bored in the field. I mean, it's it's challenging. There's no doubt about it, but it's always shifting and changing. So it's not like a static space. Um, it's always adapting to, to new models based on those external factors I mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's complexities with travel and cultural differences and uh, sensitivities. You know, there's so much to think and talk about. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why I love our conferences and sort of coming together and, you know, setting aside that space to do it. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I, I just feel like I can it, it's just very it's a very exciting space to work in um and uh, it's constantly challenging every day there's challenges um but that kind of excites me as well mm -hmm. and have you ever done one yourself because you know they have residencies for arts managers and curators and have you, have you ever done one um I've only done one and that was um when I was working at AsiaLink running the arts residency program there um, and this actually stemmed from that conference all the way back in 2012. Um, I made a connection via the Australian Embassy there with um, the people who run the Satuchi um, International Art Triennale. And they also run a Triennale that's, that's down on um, a group of islands in southern Japan in the Sito Inland Sea. And they also run another Triennale up in the mountains called Echiko Sumari. Um, and both, both of those triennales um, have the aim of um, basically bringing attention to the region, which are, are both like just insanely beautiful parts of Japan. Um, and they've got very aging populations there. Um, and so the, the aim is to sort of try and bring visitors back and boost the economy. Um, and it's actually over time, it's, it's actually working. So um, a, Japanese people have gone and attended the Trinali and decided to move back to those regions. So mm -hmm. they've reopened schools and all that sort of thing. Um, but I, I did a residency there. It was myself um, with an artist who was Australian artist Jackson Slattery, who's actually living in Canada at the moment. Um, and we also had a chef component. So I took over, um, you probably know the famous Melbourne chef, Andrew McConnell, oh, yeah. who runs um, Cutler & Co and Cumulus and 
um, now Gimlet and, and all of these amazing restaurants. So he came over um, and conducted a workshop with the local community, again, sort of the ageing population there in the community hall. Um, and it, it was sort of a cross-cultural exchange of, you know, Australian food, um, you know, Andrew McConnell, beautiful contemporary Australian um, food using local Japanese produce. Oh. And they had a cafe there that the locals would then roll out um, throughout the duration of the Triennale. So they learned how to cook the dishes from Andrew and then delivered that on the menu of this local cafe. So we were there for, um, oh, I can't remember how many <laughs> weeks, um, maybe a, a month long period or something like that. Um, and in the meantime, the artist Jackson Slattery was working on an exhibition within um, an abandoned elementary school um, and, you know, once again, highlighting the fact that, you know, these, vi these islands used to be very vibrant and populated and now there's no children, so it's like a closed school. Um, so, yeah, it was an incredible experience. Wow. I learned a lot because, you know, I, I talk about residencies every day but had never experienced one myself and, yeah, yeah certainly keen to try more in the future as well. Yeah, fascinating project. Did it, did it have a did that name did that project have a title? If someone wants to look it up online and look yeah. more into it, yeah, yeah. Um, I'll try and dig up a, a link for you as well, Amy. But it's called the Fukutaki House um, Asia Art Platform, and so it involved Australia, but also um, other countries, um, Japan, and particularly Southeast Asia. And so everyone was sort of doing a residency with their artist and chef at the same time. Um, and we replicated that project up in Echigo Sumari one year. And for that one, I took um, snuff puppets up there. So it was a performing arts focus that time around. Yeah. So you got to t taste test all this delicious food, Eliza? Oh, yeah, it was amazing. Oh. Yes, I I've done that project twice. The first time with um, Andrew McConnell, the second time with Adam Liao, who everyone oh, yeah. will know. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it was um, an incredible experience for me. Very delicious experience. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. Excellent. Thanks for sharing that. Um, yeah, and so back to, yeah, res artists. So in, in a bit of a nutshell, could you tell me and, and people that are, will be listening, you know, what what res artist does, what what um, what its yeah, mission and its values are about too? Yeah, sure. Um, so I think you mentioned at the start, we're sort of the worldwide network for arts residencies. Um, so we're the peak international body for the field. And um, really our aim is to... Um, provide quality arts residency experiences for artists in a nutshell. Um, so we're a membership-based network. At the moment, we've got about 550 members in um, 75 different countries around the globe. And they're very, very diverse. So they range from, um, you know, very tiny artist-led grassroots kind of spaces right through to huge institutions like the V&A Museum in London, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and we are a vetted network um, that is values-based. Um, and um, basically what we do is we, we charge our members an annual fee. Most of them are arts residency uh, operators, but there's also um, researchers, curators, individual artists like yourself, Amy, um, and in exchange, we offer promotion. So through our website, we've got um, residency profiles of all of our members. Um, we do open calls and publicise those on our website, but also across our social media. Mm -hmm. And we also offer um, professional development and training. So as a Res Artist member, you can log into a sort of dedicated members only portal on our website. And behind the scenes, there's a huge amount of information there. There's sort of digital libraries, um, handbooks on, you know, basically like an A to Z on how to set up a residency with concrete examples and templates from our membership. Um, that type of information, they're invited along to events. So um, largely, you know, digital webinars and, and things like that. Um, but also our annual conferences, which we've already talked about. Um, 
And so we're sort of aiming to, you know, promote the field of residencies, um, but also, you know, quality experiences for, for artists around the globe. And we do that through the, the vetted um, membership process. Mm-hmm. And can you, are you able to tell us a little bit about how you do vet residency members? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we're sort of a values-based organisation and um, that is for members, but it also applies to staff and board um, as well. It's something, you know, that we all adhere to. So our values are professionalism, diversity, sustainability and transparency. And um, we have done that on purpose because, as I mentioned earlier, the, the sort of spectrum of arts residencies around the globe is so diverse mm. that it would be unfair to, um, you know, try and um, do it any other, any other way, basically. We're trying to be inclusive and welcome people who are just starting out um, who might not have as great a resources as, as others, but the, the values are there and the drive to make it a quality experience for artists is there and a professional experience. Mm-hmm. Um, so basically, we, um, when members submit an application to join Res Artists um, through our website, We've got a membership manager, Carolyn, who um, will just make sure that they adhere to those values um, through the application information. They also have to tick a box saying that they do adhere. Um, And, you know, from time to time, quite rarely, we will get a complaint against one of the members um, from an artist who has done a residency there. Um, And in that case, we can investigate that complaint so um, we sort of try and triangulate the information as best we can by speaking to the residency provider, the artist. I have to say like nine times out of 10 is purely um, miscommunication mm-hmm. um, or just like a lack of transparency on both ends. Um, but if it was, you know, a serious claim against that organisation, that, you know, the information they'd put on their website was completely incorrect and didn't adhere to our values, then we can actually remove them from our membership. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Great, excellent. Um, and uh, what, it's so hard to define what artist residency is, Eliza. I was going to ask my next question, you know, what, what is an artist residency? Because often people will ask me, Amy, what, what is it? Especially people outside of the arts they're not too sure what it is, but it, geez, it's hard, isn't it? Because it's so <laughs> many things. And But you, there is a good list on the Res Artists website about all the different sort of aspects that it can include. But do you yeah. want to talk a little bit about it, what it is from your perspective? Yeah, sure. I know it, it is incredibly difficult to um, define, which has its challenges. Um, I guess the history of arts residencies is um, they were thought to arise in sort of the 1900s and particularly in the States and across the UK um, as sort of artist colonies, they were called at the time um, and have obviously adapted um, to, you know, external factors and um, changes in the arts landscape as time went on. Um, As I mentioned, the field is so diverse in terms of the scale of arts residencies, um, you know, the resourcing and and what they offer. Some are very um, targeted, like they might be an intersection between art and science, for example, or some are very um, more, much more that sort of traditional time and space model. Um, so what Res Artists did was, I think about five years ago now, um, we tried to develop a sort of loose definition of an arts residency. And the way we did it, I guess, in a similar way to our values-based system is we applied core principles. Mm-hmm. Um, and these we decided could be applied to any residency at all, no matter what the scale or model was. Um, So it's really around, you know, organised time, space and resources provided to the artist um, to enable the creative process. Um, And the fact that residencies are, you know, by their lexical meaning, 
um, an act of dwelling in a place. So again, I was sort of mentioning that before when you were asking the, the common mistake that artists make during the application process. Um, it's not honing in on that actual context enough. So there's no point in doing a residency really if you're just going to lock yourself in your studio and do something you could do back at home. It's all about the engagement with that community um, and the environment and that's where the outcomes are going to take place. Um, but also noting that residencies are not sort of outcome driven. Um, they don't have to be anyway, but I've never actually known an artist to do an arts residency without an outcome. They just sort of um, take place at different times. So it could be an outcome in the form of an exhibition or something um, in, you know, during the residency period in that country, or it could take place sort of years down the track or, or you know, a combination of both as well. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think residencies, obviously they're sort of intercultural um, understanding tools, but beyond that um, and more broadly than that, it's all about sort of skills and knowledge exchange as well. Um, and a very important factor of arts residencies is the, the role they play in an artist's career path as well. So, you know, increasingly as artists apply for opportunities, whether it's, you know, grants or residencies or um, prizes, exhibition opportunities, the people, the jury who are assessing um, that application will look through the international history of the artist and particularly arts residencies as a sort of um, pivotal um, stepping stone in their career path that's outlined in that artist's CV. Mm -hmm. Yeah, excellent. Um, and what, yeah, when I was reading through the sort of the list of what um, encapsulated an artist residency on the website, is one of the things that stood out to me is, you know, the engagement with the non-art sector, like through mm -hmm. a residency, you know, only engaging with the artists at that organisation and the arts community, but you're taking it out into the um, non-art people. And I think that's such a great thing about artist residencies is um, these connections with yeah, people and groups of people you would never possibly be able to connect yeah. with in any other way. Absolutely. And, and we've sort of got residencies that are very targeted in that way. So, for example, um, there's a residency, a very long-standing member of ours called Academy Schloss Solitude um, in Stuttgart in Germany, and they have a relationship with Bosch. And so it's, a, it's very much like an art science um, or, you know, engineering design kind of crossover. And they work together to sort of try and um, jointly problem solve global issues. So there's residency models and programs that are very targeted. But beyond that, um, you, asked, you asked me before why I love the field of arts residencies. And that's definitely one of the reasons. It's just they intersect into every facet of society and the world. Um, artists are sort of always reflecting the world around them in the work that they do during the residencies. And even if they were conducting a residency in a tiny sort of regional town somewhere where there's no single other artist, they're engaging with um, community. And so they might develop, you know, these amazing relationships with local fishermen or weaving women or I don't know, whatever it is um, and do some sort of public programs around that and I just think there's no other kind of aspect of the arts that really offers that that broad um, intersection I think. Mm. Yeah it opens up so just as you're talking I just think it opens up so many doors you know because a, a couple of the residencies I've been to just being you know, you've been awarded that residency, just having that information then allows you to you know, maybe visit, um, you know, other groups or other communities. It sort of is, it uh, can be a bit of like a ticket in, you know, you've been approved in this residency in this community. So, you know, you're sort of a little bit known. And so you get a bit more easy access to other, other parts of that community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I um, am known as like um, a person that loves artist residencies, of course, and I run a program to help artists with their applications. And because of this, 
um, sometimes people get in touch that want to set up an artist residency. They get in touch with me and I immediately direct them to Res Artists. You know, go to Res Artists and find out all the stuff there. But uh, so, for instance, a couple of months ago, someone got in touch that has an Airbnb and they wanted to change it into an artist residency. Um, what would you say? Well, firstly, what resources does art, Res Artists have for this? And then what would you say for people to be really clear, clear on before they, you know, tread down that track mm. um yeah i mean I, I guess like you we get contacted all the time by people um exactly looking to do that um if they become a member of res artists we've got a lot of resources um i mentioned before the members only portal we've got on our website and there's really a huge amount of information there and very concrete templates as well so I mentioned um, the A to Z handbook, and that really runs through every aspect of setting up an arts residencies right down to, you know, legal contracts that are required, um, the staff you might like to consider, um, you know, resources, all sorts of things, um, networks and connections. Um, and beyond that, what we do offer as well is the sort of connection between res artist members. So like peer-to-peer -peer connection. So um, we can do that kind of informally, but we also have a um, closed members only Facebook group. And so the idea of that is for that exact thing. So say if you're a residency that you've, you've just set up and you want to develop a partnership with Norway, but you just have no connections in Norway, you don't know where to start, you can um, put out the question to the membership and res artists um, staff are included in that as well and um, you'll get responses saying oh well I did this project with this organization in Norway I highly recommend them um, you can touch base with with this person so you're sort of getting that sort of dialogue it's it's really like a think tank of ideas on how to do things and how to broaden residency programs yeah. Um, so yeah I, I think that that's a really great place to start and um sorry the second part of your question now I've completely slipped uh, uh yeah if people yeah. if people did do that they join res artists they got the a to z handbook which is amazing because I was just looking at it uh, a few days ago and it covers so much stuff and there's mm -hmm. so many good examples in there um if they were gonna going to do that what would you think they should be aware of before they jump in just so oh, they yeah. have no clue about artist residencies yeah uh, I mean, it just depends on um, the situation that they're coming from. Um, it, you know, some people have a lot of money and, you know, not the knowledge. Some people are the other way around. But I guess um, just to go in with an open mind in terms of like residencies are not really like a, a huge money making uh, venture, which I think a lot of people um, are surprised by. Um, but, you know, it takes a lot of resources to run arts residencies um, properly. And it's also, you know, you might be letting strangers into your home, for example. These are the considerations you need to think about, you know, your public and private time and how you kind of separate that, how you vet um, applications and strongly, you know, encourage Zoom interviews and things like that before accepting um, people to the residency. But yeah, there's lots of considerations, but I'd say they're the two major ones, the finances and also that trying to sort of retain the boundaries between the sort of public and private aspects of your lives as well. Mm, yeah, excellent. Yeah, there's a whole section in the A to Z on um, artist, artist management. Mm. And I think it's so important, you know, that each each body, the residency and the artist knows where they stand, you know, with yeah. really clear um, documentation contracts and, uh, you know, a handbook for the artist when they come is yeah. so important that, that you just know where you stand. Absolutely. And, uh, yeah, we really encourage that sort of structured approach because you can imagine, I mean, and there's some quite good articles on it as well um, and sort of memoirs of arts residency managers who have had to go, you know, above and beyond, like doing things in the middle of the night, fixing a tap or whatever, and then having, you know, they're, they're sort of like a jack or Jill of all trades, having to 
respond to not only the artist project, but also the physical structure of the residency place itself, engage with the community. It's a very, very broad role. Mm, yeah. Um, and when um, the pandemic was happening, sort of, I'll sort of segue to that, mm. um, I imagine you were getting, uh, and the office there was getting so many calls and emails about artists, you know, possibly stranded in artist residencies and artist residency organisations really, you know, feeling it terribly and um, money, you know, people's money being wrapped up in other residencies. What, what was that time like for you and the organisation? Stressful, <laughs> in one word. Um, yeah, it was very full on. Um, I mean, for all of us, I think, in all aspects of our lives, you know, professional and privately as well. But um, for res artists anyway, when it first hit, we were we were really being bombarded with um, phone calls and emails, as you say, from stranded artists who were had, had been doing a residency in a country and couldn't get back home. Um, or on the flip side, arts residencies who were, you know, didn't know what to do or they were literally like crumbling before our eyes. We had some really sad stories of, um, you know, artists and arts residencies, you know, literally sell selling off the furniture in the residency space just to try and get through and make it work. Um, so what we decided we sort of you know took a moment to just quickly try and um, evaluate the situation and where we felt we were best placed to help was um, mostly through our website and digital resources by developing um, sort of guides to help people navigate through the situation and help them adapt um, so you'll see on our website, and I can provide you with a, a link afterwards, um, we de developed a dedicated COVID-19 section So, and try to offer advice on both sides. So if you're an artist, what can you do? If you're stranded, you know, get in touch with your local embassy or consulate. Um, if you're a arts residency, um, you know, what funding opportunities might be out there for you to be able to continue on during this difficult time mm -hmm. um, and we also conducted a three-part survey so we set up a partnership with UCL um, in London and examined sort of the immediate medium term and we're just about to start the long-term um, impact of COVID on the international arts residencies field so we surveyed around the globe artists, arts residencies um, and tried with funders as well um, to look at the impact. And, you know, it was so, um, we, knew, we knew it was bad because we were getting the inquiries, but just seeing those figures there um, in the reports was absolutely kind of staggering. Um, and we've got the re results of those surveys on our website um, so I encourage everyone to have a read through and of, of course it's not over now we're still sort of navigating through the pandemic but we've seen some really really positive signs of um, you know international activity resuming obviously but we've also had members who needed to kind of pause at the height of the pandemic come back on board and reopen their residencies so it's all, um, you know, pointing towards a, a positive um, environment and path forward. And the other thing we did, Amy, you mentioned our conference um, in Kyoto. We had planned to have an in-person conference in Bangkok, um, but as the pandemic continued, we kept pushing it back and pushing it back and unfortunately decided um, it needed to go fully digital. But for, that, for us, that was quite exciting as well. It opened up an opportunity because it was our first ever virtual conference. Um, and that was really, the, the topic of that was like, what is the path forward? Um, talking about the impact a little bit um, and the survey results, but also like, what is the path forward? And thinking about um, digital and hybrid residencies in particular. Mm. And so there's a lot of information on that on our website. Um, but, you know, there's 
positives and negatives of everything. And I guess with every challenge, there comes an opportunity. And one of the positives for the field is this sort of increase in digital activity, which I hope is here to stay. We, we sort of never see that as replacing the in-person um, exchange, but it's very much complementary to it. Um, and we're really hoping that that continues because it has opened up um, accessibility for a range of people as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and during, um, you know, when the pandemic was happening, and yeah, as you said, it still is, um, some artists would get in touch with me, you know, quite stressed about it too, and, you know, worried about a deposit that they had paid that they weren't getting back. And that just made me think, well, you know, you, you and the organisation or as artists, you know, you, you have limitations too about what, how you can get involved in, um, you know, a, an artist and an arts residency organisation sort of dealings and their relationships. So, I mean, you, yeah, how did, how did, what do you think about that? The, the limitations that you have, you can't sort of get, you can't get in the middle and solve all these problems between these two different parties, can you? No, that's right. I mean, it would just be impossible. It's like, we're, we're even though we're a large organization we're actually a very small team so um we've just increased recently but there's only three part-time staff members who run the whole thing um but also even if we were a huge organization it just has so many complexities to do that um so i mentioned we've got a complaints procedure um earlier and even within that you know we can't offer legal advice or anything of that sort. That's purely why we assess against the values. Um, so I guess we sort of took the same, you know, remit when it came to the pandemic and we tried to offer general advice. Um, it's also like incredibly challenging, but, you know, addressing everything at a global level because, you know, nothing can be applicable to the whole globe. So, um, yeah, so for example, we did have artists who were getting in touch with us upset because, um, you know, perhaps they had planned to do a residency, they would paid an amount up front, and then because of the pandemic had to cancel. So we would sort of step in and provide advice to the residency operators if they were our members and say, we recommend that you um, give this person a sort of credit voucher. Um, and keep it, you know, extended out for at least a year, I think we said at the time. Um, so we'd sort of step in to try and offer that general advice, but it, it, it is very confusing. And I think the pandemic has, in a way, revealed a couple of holes um, with things. So we always encourage um, our members to have contracts with their artists that outline the terms and conditions of the residency. Um, of course, no one had factored in a global pandemic, but, you know, things like force measure, you know, need to be um, factored in from now on, but also just thinking about the fact that the artist is coming from one set of rules um, and under one law of a country. So maybe I'm an Australian artist looking to do a residency in Romania and the contract is under Romanian law because um, that is where it was created. So the artist needs to be aware of that at the time of signing. Um, I mean, I very much hope nothing like that will happen again, but, you know, who knows? Yeah, and sort of goes to remind artists too to, you know, make sure they get getting a contract, make sure they thoroughly read it and ask questions too. And Absolutely. they're happy, they're happy with that and they know what's going on. Because I remember when I did some of my first ones, I sort of just skimmed through it. Oh yeah, yeah, okay, sign, sign. I'm so excited. And yeah, um, and it, yeah read the read the fine print as they say. Exactly. I mean most of the time it's probably fine, but you just don't know when things like this are going to come about or you know, even without the pandemic, if you had something happen and you weren't able to conduct that residency you want to have you know some sort of insurance that you can have a, a travel voucher or something that um kind of covers you for that period of time mm, yes yeah 
just looking down at my, oh, I, I will, we'll tail off soon, but I'll look at down at my questions that I want to, okay. I have a gazillion questions, I have a gazillion questions I could ask you, Eliza. Um, um, and uh, oh, what the other thing I want to ask is how is res artists engaging with residencies or encouraging them to, you know, be open to people that, you know, want to bring their children to an artist residency or, or need to bring their partner or um, people that have a disability of some sort, you know, and I, I think it's, you know, gradually becoming more um, on the website there. I see there's a section, you know, you can tick if you want to search for a residency that would um, allow you to have a companion. But yeah. um, what, what's Res Artists doing in that to um, encourage that even more? Yeah, no, it's a really good question and something we get um, asked quite a lot by artists, you know, especially, you know, can their family come along, that sort of thing. Um, and sort of, I, I would say contrary to people's um, understanding, there is actually a huge amount of residencies that offer opportunities for families or, or partners. So as you mentioned um, on our website, where we list all the residency profiles of our members, there are certain search parameters that artists can use to narrow down their search. So they can choose a country or a discipline or duration of residency, whatever it might be. Um, to answer both of your questions at the same time, they can search for um, wheelchair accessible residencies. And then they can also search for um, our companions allowed. So children um, or partners or pets. So, um, I was just having a quick look now while I'm talking and out of our 550 members, 329 allow for partners. So it's more than people think it's, yeah. it's a lot, but it does just depend. I would also um, say two things on that. I'd, I'd encourage um, artists to really question like whether they want their family to attend um, I think, yes, absolutely, it's it's great in some circumstances. As you know, we were talking before, you remembered in Kyoto, I had my little son attend with me. He was um, a baby at the time. So sometimes you, you just need to do these things, but also just sort of thinking like, are you going to get the best for yourself out of that residency mm -hmm. experience? And also just keeping in mind that um, some countries and some um, residency spaces just simply can't offer family friendly residencies just by their very nature of the resources that they have in that space it might just be you know a tiny room that they have or might be dangerous for kids to attend or you know things like that so just keeping that into consideration mm -hmm. um what we are hoping to do, we've we've been applying for funding so far, haven't been successful, but you know, hopefully someone hears this and wants to fund the project. But we really, really want to up the ante on um, the accessible residencies. And so um, the search parameter on our website is sort of quite old, to be honest. And um, we, we only ask for um, wheelchair accessibility, but we'd like to um, we'd like artists to be able to search for other accessibility needs on our mm -hmm. website. Mm -hmm. And in order to do that, we need a bit of funding. So we're, we're really looking to partner with organisations like Arts Projects Australia and Arts Access to be able to do this properly. Um, but also across our whole website to be able to make the actual website more accessible as well and, you know, user-friendly for artists with accessibility needs. So um that has it's really our next priority and I think um you know it should be a priority anyway but it was really highlighted when we had that um digital conference that streamed live from Bangkok last year mm -hmm. um because we found the audience members there you know we had people attending who'd never been able to attend a res artists conference in person mm -hmm. um who were able to attend and I guess it's similar in a way to the way um, hybrid and digital residencies have opened up pathways for, you know, people with accessibility needs, but also even like First Nations artists, for example, um, who might not usually be able to go on residency opp opportunities because they need to, you know, stay on country or they have certain um, limitations there. So it, it's really... Um, trying to offer both things together, both in-person experiences and hybrid and digital options, mm -hmm. but making sure that, yeah, 
we do that in an accessible way as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, one thing we're also talking about before we um, started recording is the um, the dedicated part you've got on the Res Artist website for um, the war in the Ukraine mm -hmm. and uh, this list, which I was I was gobsmacked. I hadn't seen it before. A list of um, emergency residencies, artist residencies. So people in all different countries opening up their residencies to um, artists and creative people in the Ukraine. Could you talk a bit more about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we were actually scheduled to have a conference in Ukraine um, this September. And so we've been working away with our partners over there. Um, we, we're working with Isolatsia, who are a um, residency organisation and various funding partners there and planning for it to be an in-person conf in conference. Um, and then as sort of things started to get tense, but also based on this idea of the success of the Bangkok conference and accessibility, we decided we were going to have some hybrid um, or digital elements to the conference. And then of course, um, the war in Ukraine commenced. And so we've um, been liaising with our partners um, the whole time, firstly, to make sure that they were okay. Um, and they've all got you know, some pretty um, horrific personal stories, I will say, in regards to that. Um, but we decided to cancel the conference completely um, and largely out of respect for them. We sort of, you know, as interesting as it would be to completely change, you know, path and have a, a conference, um, it could even be about this very theme of humanitarian residencies. And that may well happen in the future. We just sort of thought it wasn't right without our Ukrainian friends being able to be part of that conversation. Um, so we decided to redirect our efforts towards humanitarian needs. And so what we did was set up a dedicated section on, on our website. It's the first thing that will pop up. If you go to our website, there's a pop-up window and it will take you there. Mm -hmm. And um, we're working with our Ukrainian friends to develop all of these resources. So weekly, we sort of share back and forth, um, you know, thing, opportunities, I guess you would call them, that are happening um, in that space. So largely speaking, they are emergency residencies for um, Ukrainian arts and cultural professionals. And um, we've been really, you know, amazed and proud, I would say, of our membership who have responded. So mm -hmm. it, it only took a few residencies to sort of start the ball rolling and adapt their programming and open their doors for Ukrainian um arts and cultural professionals in need and then there was just like this domino effect and everyone uh, got on board so as you said there's huge lists of residencies around the world that are doing that there's also other resources there like um you know funds where if people don't have a residencies maybe they're an artist they'd like to still help they can um you know donate financially and, and support mm -hmm. and just sort of a general um, section on how they can help with the situation and I, I guess that's what I mean when I spoke earlier on about the field being so changeable and adapting to external factors it um it's I can't really think of anything else um that can do that in such a um intimate way as well it's, it is like that people to people contact so some of these residencies for example are hosting families there's absolutely no expectation of an um, artistic outcome although that may occur um, but they're even providing you know counseling and stipends it's like a safe space there's a house there's food um, yeah it, it's just so important Mm. Well, it's, yeah, it sort of marks the importance of res artist, doesn't it, as the network to create the connections for all this to happen and for you to have the website there to house these things so everyone can go and see what's available. Um, so I wanted to just tail off with um, 
sort of saying that, yeah, res, for artists, res artists can be much more than what we think it is. You know, initially I thought, oh, it's a list of all the residencies. You can search for up what you want in a residency, but it's much more than that. You know, it's really supportive if you want to establish a residency, a support for the members. I didn't know about the private Facebook page that you can be in and, and have that great connection and um and you know experience with the people in the Facebook group uh, and also for artists too to to go in and see this world that we we sort of see from a different perspective but to go and see that and mm -hmm. to be exposed to yeah all the things that are changing right now like it's quite an exciting um field to be in as you've as you've described um Eliza I wanted to say yeah a big thank you to um for speaking with me today and I wanted to mention uh these resources these places you can find out more about res artists and I'll also pop them in the notes as well but the website is resartists.org and you can find on there how to become a member uh, and then you're also on Facebook you can search res artists on Facebook on Instagram res artists on Twitter as well you're covering all your bases res <laughs> artists and uh, there's a special page there, as Eliza said, when you go on the website, the war in the Ukraine, information will pop up immediately. So you can go in there and have a look. It's quite amazing. Uh, and also the COVID surveys, which will the third instalment will be coming out soon. Yeah, that will come out soon. So we'll keep you posted. And also, I just wanted to mention, um, obviously, Ukraine is a focus right now, but we also have another section called resources which lists opportunities for sort of other humanitarian crises, the sort of um, refugee residencies and a whole plethora of things in there as well. Yeah, I really encourage people to check it out. Um, thank you so much, Eliza Dawson. <laughs> I, I, so my sincere apologies for that. At the start. No, not at um, all. Thank you yeah. so much. Yeah, thank you, thank Amy, you. for initiating this. And um, I hope everyone and all your listeners get a great deal out of it and head to the Resartis website for more info. Definitely, definitely. And I hope to meet you soon in Melbourne. Yes, in person. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye.